Welcome to the Expert Network Team Podcast. Where our goal is to inform and educate our listeners on matters related to finance, legal, insurance, accounting, and other interests that are of personal and business nature. We hope you will find our content useful as well as entertaining. The Expert Network Team consists of Carl Frank of AI Financial, Mike Miller of Miller and Associates CPAs, Jeff Cromendike of Security First Insurance Agency, and I'm Nathan Merrill. I'm an attorney at Goodspeed and Merrill. Together, our independent team combines our expertise to provide you insights and solutions, some straightforward, some profound, for real-life opportunities we see on a daily basis. We hope you enjoy the information contained in today's podcast and find it useful. If you'd like to learn more or desire to meet with any of the Expert Network Team members in person, you can contact us at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's I-N-F-O at expertnetworkteam.com. We encourage you to take advantage of a free consultation with any of our team members. Just mention this podcast when you schedule your appointment. Now on to today's podcast. Welcome to today's podcast. I'm Carl Frank, and with me I've got Nate Merrill. Hi, Nate. Howdy. I am really excited about today's podcast. So tonight we're going to talk about the importance of different books in our lives. And, you know, I'm, I have an undergraduate degree in English. I got my first master's degree in English right out of college. They gave me a free ride, and I said, well, I'll just read more books and write. You bet. <laughs> so there's a huge array of literature that's in my history there, especially 20th century American literature, which was what I focused on. And that was a crazy... So talking about books, man, we can just go off the deep end. Totally. Off the deep end. And you are way more read than well, I am. Well, so. uh, that may be, but it's probably because I didn't actually do a lot of that in... You were you know, an autodidact. Well, you taught yourself. A little bit. I mean, um, and, and I don't mean to just jump right in here, but I think I've learned in hindsight that the key to wanting to read is an interest in the topic. Yes. Um, you right. know, in high school, when you're forced to read things that are just like, oh, I don't get and this. it's meaningless. Right. Or you just don't, you don't get the connection, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it that, makes no sense. That has part to do, well, it has a lot to do with a lot of different things. Well, but, I mean, your parents matter. Yeah. I think that's a big deal. Um, and your first, group? first a, a real quick Quality disclaimer, because I don't think either of us are going to pick this. There, there are obvious books that are impactful and meaningful in very deep ways that we are not going to address. I'll, I'll just yeah. throw it out there. We got the Bible, of course, of obviously, yeah. as a really the, amazing the most book. But yeah, the, the most, the, right. that aside, you know, right. we're going to talk more kind of secular and... And, uh, and I think we're going to avoid the political. political we're going to do our best. And yes, so the religion and politics are out. Right. Money's in as a fair game Absolutely. because that's kind of a topic of... That's kind of like my area of expertise, right? And, that's, my, uh, that's my life's calling. So some of the areas that I think, if we can try to highlight books, yours and mine, that fit into these categories, there's the the improvement books, like the educational improvement. There's the nonfiction, historical type stuff. And then there's fiction, novels, entertainment type things, but that, that can still be very oh, meaningful. Oh, incredibly impactful. And our hope to our listeners here is that maybe some of these will give you ideas of things that you can use for all those purposes. You can get a lot of entertainment out of a self-help book, and you get a lot of self-help out of an entertainment book. There's no doubt about it. Yep. So there's a lot of wisdom all over. Well, Why don't you start us off? I will start off. So this was really fun when you mentioned this to me, and I thought, oh, my goodness, how am I going to focus? Because all the books I'm reading right now are historical, um, uh, you know, the nonfiction books. They're great. But I'm not going to begin there. I'm going to begin with a book that I realized over the 20 years that I've been running this company – that um, it, that I read prior to that, that really impacted me. So it's a it's a book from 1993 called The Executive's Compass by James O'Toole. It's probably completely out of print. You'll have a hard time finding it. But what this dude did in this book is break down a lot of the uh, challenges we have in business into four different areas, and I and they're they're competing with each other. And I I don't think you'll you'll disagree that all four of these things are really really important. Here are the four words. Uh, liberty, equality, efficiency, and community. Right, they're all super important. Yeah, and I don't care where you are in the political spectrum; they're all important to you. But as an easy example, some people on this side want more liberty; some people on the other side want more equality. 
right? And those two are sometimes at odds, but I think we all view them all as important. Right. Right? That's an easy example. Community sometimes is at direct odds with efficiency. So it's really efficient to build a car with robots. That's completely diametrically opposed to building a community. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so these are four things that I see taking place even in our little company of, you know, 15 people here at A&I Financial Services. We always want it to be more efficient and we always want to build bigger community. I mean, look at our podcasts that we've done on the COVID and building culture and yeah. and some of the other ones we've done on all these things. I, I, I love the way he simplifies these four things and, and it's just a nice way to look at a complex problem and say, well, maybe, you know, if we map this thing out in these four quadrants, we need we could be a lot more efficient. Like we're wasting time and it's really frustrating and that's actually hurting community. So let's, you know, invest in some technology and maybe we'll have more time to have fun right. with each other and other things like equality and and liberty. You you seem to have this subject matter at pretty good recall. When was the last time you read this book? Almost twenty years ago. Isn't it amazing how sometimes there's things it's like still that? there. Yeah. It has such a profound impact, and it and it it makes this jump out to me. This point, which is how important it is that we find ourselves constantly in a state of learning, and this is why you know that. when I jo- when I kind of mock myself for not being much of a a reader prior to law school it was when I really developed the need to read because you just can't do it without reading. I mean, you're just oh. reading all the time, hours it, upon hours upon hours a day. It's a killer for a lot of people who'd otherwise be great lawyers. And it's a brain drain. But mm. um, I've since learned, having endured law school, how much I enjoy taking in knowledge and information. And, and um, I'm, I, I would imagine if I could... If I could make a supposition here you're probably going to pick up that book and and just oh, review yeah. it and, and i think i will yeah yeah i want to look at it again tonight yeah I'm and i'm that way a lot it's the, not that big the books i read early on and these are obvious i'm gonna i'm gonna start with some easy ones but the the books i read early on in my life uh probably end of high school early college career i don't know how i got dialed into them are the covey books mm. so i started with right. an introduction to seven habits of highly effective people just it's 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 a must read. If you it haven't, is. you need to read it. And if you haven't read it in the last ten years, again, I'd say read it again. Um, right alongside that, I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat here and, and lump a couple of books together. Um, is first things first, which is Stephen Covey, kind of following up with the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and then another one, and I believe this was in between those two, was Principle Centered Leadership. And those three books. Um, because of how well he presents in those books all these concepts, you know, simple things of seek first to understand right. um, um, and then to be understood, uh, sharpening the saw. I, could, I couldn't right. rattle them all off, all the seven habits, but I know if I came across one, I'd be like, oh, that's a seven habit right. because exactly. they are so true yeah. in terms of their application that if you, if you can... Um, internalize them and make them part of your habits. And that's his whole point in that book is you make these part of your habits, you almost can't help but be successful. Yeah. And they're built on... You certainly get more improved, yeah. Not to take anything away from Covey, um, but as I've read more and more over the years, older and older literature on these self-help ideas, I don't know that a whole lot of his ideas were original. Or new. Right. No. But it was how he organized them and present them, it communicated, you know, really spoke to me yeah. at the time and have stuck with me just like that book you mentioned. Exactly. Has been a part of your way of persona, thinking. your yeah. way of thinking exactly. ever since. So those would be my first three kind of foundational books that I believe I are it. volumes of the same effort. Oh, I love it. And, you know, one of the things, I, I think you're right, right? And I think a lot of that, you know, if we go back a long, long ways, um, and certainly it's becoming popular in our office. And for whatever reason, during the pandemic, it's stoicism. It's the original, it's the, it's the Romans, man. 300 years BC, uh, you know, Epictetus and, um, Epictus and, uh, um, I'm forgetting all their names, but you know, that's a big deal. And the, the old philosophy, the old philosophy from the Romans a long time ago. And, and it's a it's something that's running through our office right now. People are reading the Daily Stoic. There, so the Daily Stoic I think is a good one because it's a one or two sentence thing. You can look at it and say, ah, there's a lot of wisdom in there. This there's is a like a like a daily thought. It's a daily of- thought. It's a 365 page book, one page per day. Read it. 
and get a little bit of wisdom, think about it, and go back to your life and say, ah, you know, that made a lot of sense. Now I really get it. And a lot of the stoicism is, um, uh, you know, it's giving you individual advice. It's saying, you know, this is a practical thing, kind of like a Kobe thing. And that, that, that maybe that's where Kobe got some of his ideas. I don't know. But that's kind of the uh, something I see going around our office um, right now. So I don't. Sp- that's not your second book. Right? It's not actually, okay, so but you got me on that. Book? My second book absolutely is Capitalism Without Capital. Now I'm a finance guy, so you know I I really enjoy um, some of the details. But you know we live in a world that can't be explained by old fashioned accounting. Um, you know assets are not uh, depreciating assets that can be counted and weighed and put on a scale or done in inventory like we used to do in the auto shop when I was 15. Uh, working at the Chevron, right? I mean, it's not just a bunch of nuts and bolts. So, yeah, and when you hear about teenagers making three, five, ten grand a month on yeah, TikTok, they can make. They got nothing. They can make hundreds of thousands of right. dollars. These kids, and they got they got no assets, and they've just got a lot of capital. So how did that happen? Social capital. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and real financial Followers. capital now. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, and you can't. How do you sell a follower? I don't know. But in any event, they've got a lot of income. Right. It's, it's it's eyes on product. That's all social media. I've I've come to found out. I've talked to some influencers. Yeah, yeah like younger influencers, and it's just all about companies getting people to get eyes on product. It's, I think we need to get ears on products. Somehow. Yes, we, we need to figure out here in our to, podcast. Let's yeah. let's do that. You and I. So anyway, back to capitalism without. So capital. it's a book that you know is probably five hundred pages too long, but it's exactly right. And and maybe the five hundred pages that um, it spends in really boring detail about accounting are what we need to change the way we think about accounting in, the, in our country right now. Because as we value companies, um, and, and, and we're doing that, we're making investment decisions, and uh, you look at a, a technology firm that has massive income and massive revenues and growing very quickly, you know, their assets might be really, really tiny, and you've got to wonder how in the world can that be? Right. right. How can that be? Because you can't just use a book value the to dot manage. The dot-com skepticism kind yeah, of. Yeah, 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 yeah. And dot-com, I mean, you know, you and That I, did collapse all, but, but the, that's I, what I'm it saying. gave birth to a better version of what was being born out of the idea of That's exactly what I'm saying. Technology. So you can't have that because that was all speculation right. and bubble back in the, you know, in the 90s and then 2000 when it crashed. And yet today we have the most valuable companies in the world. Out of the top 10 companies, eight of them are tech firms. And you got to wonder yourself, how could that possibly be? How could the eight out of the 10 largest companies in the world be technology with basically no assets? And so it's offering a different way to view that. And, mm-hmm. and one of them might be something like what you just said, but a moat is another one. And, and a platform for distributing their products um, is a huge one. And that's an asset that they're, they're proposing some ideas for. So in our industry, I think it's a big one. Um, and it's something that I enjoyed reading. Still love to see a little more nuts and bolts in our economy, but... <laughs> How about some bridges and roads without potholes? That would be too much to ask of. Well, we're not driven, giving political. Have you driven I seventy lately? So on the I north drive side? it all the time. You drive twenty. Well, I I get on and I go west yeah. from the city. So. I was really impressed when I drove seventy to the airport from twenty five to the airport where it used to be Globeville. That massive bridge that they're in tunnel that mm-hmm. they're it's awesome man. yeah it's gonna I'm be really impressed yeah yeah i'm really impressed i think you're doing a great job so i'm gonna some of the stuff now i'm looking so i i read this is gonna shock a lot of people i read while i drive <laughs> um <laughs> it's a podcast <laughs> I hope. Yeah, no, it's it's yeah, but it's Audible. So I use Audible, and and it works for me. I've talked to a lot of people about this. Some people say, "Oh, that's cheating. That's not really reading," but the, the fact of the matter is, I'm an auditory learner. I've always uh, like when I went to college, I would just I would take outlines for notes, but I would just listen because yeah, I, I can. It. I you know, some people have a photographic memory right. where they look at something and they remember yeah, it. I have an auditory it. memory, so like it it records everything and I can almost play it back in my head. That's oh, how my that's I'm how learning about you. That's how you do it. So um it's so I, I listen to all my books. So I'm looking here at my Audible library and um I'm going back pretty deep here because some of the first ones I did were ones I like we were just talking about wanted to refresh my memory on. And I'll tell you this is a book for the ages. I'm building this up. I'm building up the, the it. tension. It is it is truly a life-altering book. It's a paradigm-shifting book. Um, it will change your perspective on everything. And it's a book 
by Dr. Viktor Frankl called Man's Search for Meaning. Oh, my gosh. My wife just finished it. Holy cow. I, I would suggest this is a book that needs to be read once every five years or so because, it, it again, um, the context on this is he was interned at Auschwitz. I believe Auschwitz. Auschwitz. Yeah. yeah, he's an Auschwitz survivor. Survivor. And his whole family was slaughtered. Yeah, and shipped off to different camps. Oh. And, yeah, but he talks how about did he, survive? he talks about the process of survival and how it is, um, and this ties. You'll see a, a recurring theme as I get into some other books here. But he talks about how meaning and purpose right. are essential to the human condition. Yeah, and this gets back to when we were talking about culture and you know, belonging and stuff like that. I think he really caught on to something here that that can be very real, at, like in your family, in your immediate you know, circle of influence in your, in your company, in your community, in your church is, um, helping people find purpose and belonging. And I'm grossly oversimplifying his premise and his conclusions, but you know, those things that he observed on how people survived, how he survived the darkness and the dismal yeah. conditions of these concentration camps and how when when he would observe people basically losing hope mm. they could have been perfectly healthy he was a physician right they could have been completely healthy and he would observe them just die right because they lost hope. meaning purpose and so if if you haven't ever read it that one needs in my mind I'm going to I'm going to leapfrog anything you say is that that's the number one book that everybody from 80 to 18 mm. needs to read. Below 18, it's pretty heavy stuff. But I would say at 18, at a minimum, if you got a graduating senior, they need to read wow. that book. Man. Just like they need to watch Saving Private Ryan. I love it. They need to read this book. They need to understand the deprivations of the human condition and how to rise above it. Wow. It's going to be hard to follow that, Nate. Victor Frankel. Oh yeah, I picked. Goodness. I was going to say that's kind of an obvious. You but. did, yeah, you did great. That is a powerful, powerful story, and and hope, uh, um, hope is itself, I think, a deep theme that I think um, we don't spend a lot of time uh, thinking about it, and that that has deep uh, religious uh, meanings as well. Absolutely, um, yeah. I think that there's a lot of profundity in um, in in Mr. Frankel's vision of hope, actually. So okay, so I'm going to go really shallow. I'm going to go something totally different. I'm going to talk. We about talked about entertainment and leisure. As yeah, well, so. and this one, this one is a historical piece. I loved this book. Absolutely loved it. Um, it's called Money for Nothing. Um, it's the story of the of the South Sea Bubble, and it's absolutely apropos for what the world is going through right now, where money is infinite. And, and this how is, it didn't work is out. the South Sea Bubble, remind me of the time frame on that. Yeah, this is the 1700s. So this is going on with the slave trade. And this is going on right before America is about to split, and it's still a colony in England. And England is about to get very, very, very wealthy on the, uh, on the slave trade, in the sugar trade. And it's, you know, so the whole back of this story is just ripe with, you know, our culture today and Black Lives Matter and mm-hmm. reparations and everything that is going on that we're a country still, like, feeling guilt over, right? I mean, it's mm-hmm. a really big deal. And at the same time, uh, England is going through a massive bubble, they're, they're, you know, and and it's you know, clearly it's it's a time that's not like today's time where we've got Bitcoin or any, any you know, or alternative fiat. currencies, right? These alternative Spanish Maravi Mar- or whatever is really yeah, the only exactly right. This is all about gold. This is all about silver. This is a time when they decided that they were going to pen the pound to the silver, and so people were just f- scraping off their their dimes, the equivalent of you know their their two pence, and they were making them into four pence. They were just scraping off the silver and making new, and they're making fake coins, and it was just a crazy, crazy time. And it's a fascinating lesson in the in the um, which, uh, regardless of, again, whichever political perspective you have about the dangers and the opportunities of massive, massive amounts of money that didn't used to exist. Uh, just a few years. So this before. is historical with commentary, or how would you? Call oh no, it? it's all history. So it's, it's all straight history. history. Yeah, it's straight history, and it's got um, it's got a lot of character and personality. I mean, the 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 South Sea Bubble was a uh, the basic scheme was that they would take the 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 debt of the of the United Kingdom, which was still England, I think at that point. I don't think they called themselves the UK yet, and uh, they would monetize it and they turn it into a company asset, the South Sea Company. They just buy the debt of the of the government, and so the government was debt free 
It was it incredible. sounds like uh, Enron. Right? Almost like that. Yeah, <laughs> turning an, yeah, yeah, taking it, right, pretending an asset as an income. Well, anyway, so yeah, it's, it was a debacle. It was a debacle. And, and, it, and it, it gathered up even Isaac Newton, one of the most brilliant men of all time, was a sucker. In the, and it's just a great, great story about, wow, you know, you better remain humble because uh, even the things that look too, you know, uh, for sure are not. All right, so I will follow suit with you because um, history is something that I've made one of my principal preoccupations anymore because, again, I can't explain something without giving backstory here, so I'll just do it again. Um, as I look at some of the things we struggle with as a country, I think a lot of it has to do with a, a, um, a lack of understanding, a disconnectedness with our history. And when I say history, I'm not just talking like, you know, you, you ask a, a young person anymore what history is, and they're thinking like the 2000s, maybe as far back as 1990, but to have them consider, contemplate, and and evaluate the, like you say, the 1700s, the 1800s is just, it's like going to Mars. Sometimes it's too hard. Right. They can't get it. And and so I have really um, developed a passion for the founders. And it's always inherently been there, but I've taken a, I've taken a more active role to understand who they were and what they were about and you know, their, their weaknesses, their strengths, their challenges, their everything. And um, always been an a extraordinarily big fan of Thomas Jefferson, George Washington. I mean, who can't be a fan of George Washington? But one of the ones I've always struggled with because of, I think, in some respects, the way I learned the history kind of slanted me against him was John Adams. And I'll tell you, I read that book by David McCullough, Mm-hmm. Again, this is, I think, somewhat of an easy one to pick, but these are, I think, profound books. But David McCullough's uh, John Adams, which has been made into an HBO yeah, special. Yeah, I thought it was a great series. Um, John Adams has taken on new life for me and new respect mm-hmm. for John Adams. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just lump into this because they kind of go hand in hand, is the Alexander Hamilton. Oh, yeah. I read uh, Alexander Hamilton by Ron Chernow, who's the other great... Um, American writer. historian. Yeah, great writer. Both of those books just gave me a, a, a much greater appreciation for the Federalist you know, side of the founding that I didn't appreciate as much the first time through. Right. So and um, yep. So if you're going to read about two founders, two books, it was it's the Ron Chernow book called, of all things, Alexander Hamilton. Imagine that. And uh, David McCullough's book called John Adams. Um Great, great, great historical books. Oh, I love and it. And, you know, no point in me telling you who John Adams is. Everybody knows oh my gosh. Hamilton. But yeah. it's not the musical. It's much better. Yeah. Read the book. Yeah. That's well, all I'll I, say. There you go. So <laughs> I'll leave it at that, too. I'm actually really fond of the musical. So, all right, so here's another one. This is a historical book. And this is one that's really important for our firm. So our company has a nautical theme because um, my father-in-law, who founded the firm in 86, did so after leaving the Navy, and he was in a submarine. And so there's a wonderful, wonderful book that's been declassified called Blind Man's Bluff. It's now out of print again. I think they keep selling out, and they don't make enough of them. Blind Man's Bluff. Uh, I've got the book, two copies of it sitting right here in front of me, but I can't remember the author's name. You can find it everywhere. Uh, it's great, and it's all about the submarine stories during the Cold War. I'm telling you, Nate, we are lucky we're still here as a country. There, there's a story in there where they accidentally dropped a nuclear bomb off of the boat uh, in uh, the San Francisco Harbor, and the submarine had to go save it. This is me giving a visual like, you've got to be kidding me. It's an awesome book full of <laughs> stories like that. These declassified, how did we make it through the Cold War without blowing our own selves up? Right type of stories because the submarines you know on a on a ship it's really important the captain is the boss right but not on a submarine when the cia comes on the submarine the cia is given the captain's orders and oftentimes a submarine would leave the captain and the navigation officer would be the only people who knows where they're going and then the, the spook as they call it the which is probably politically incorrect today <laughs> anyway the cia would come in and say oh no captain we're not going there we're really going here Awesome, terrifying stories. And there was a, I mean, the Bay of Pigs, there's a submarine in the Bay of Pigs nobody knew about. 
There's submarines right off the coast of the Soviet Union during the middle of the war. Great, great stuff. Really, really fascinating stories. Yeah. No, that's what I'd say. I mean, history, real history, not like refabricated history is is compelling. I mean, you make the comment that it's, it's remarkable that we got through the Second World War as a country. When I read some of the, the history about Washington, there's a couple books in here I, I won't mention in this particular podcast on Washington, but just the history of the revolution and how fortuitous, how providential it was that our country even came into being. It's amazing. It's like... We're so fortunate. It's like uh, it's so Guatemala fragile. beating the United States. <laughs> no, I'm so dead fragile. serious. It's so it's fragile. <laughs> how we did it um, yeah. is, is, is a story that yeah. could be endlessly studied. It's because amazing. it is it is not something you can get in a right. in in any in any real sense and, and I would even suggest as people I mean here's where I go really off the deep end. Read the book and then go go see the places. Yeah. Go go be there. Go do the tour. Go feel the, the spirit of the yeah. Go to oh. go to Gettysburg. Oh my gosh. You know, read about it and then go there because it's it'll take on new meaning beyond the little audible tour that so you can thankful. take. Yeah. So anyway. Love it. So um gosh, I, I'm scrolling through my thing and I'm like, we're gonna have to do ten podcasts on book I know, recommendations. I know, I know, I know. So, I'm trying to limit mine too. I have one more really good one that I want to talk about. So yeah, I'll do I'll do an obscure one here. This yeah. is this is I haven't done any that are true entertainment yet, but um maybe I'll do a, a few of those in the next one. This one is a true story. And it's a facepalm type of story. And um, this individual is actually still living, but uh, it's called The Orphan Keeper. Have you heard about this book? No. So, and, and so I read it. This is a type of book I read for entertainment. It's a true story, um, real events, but it's about a child in India. And there's been a couple of movies. I, I guess this thing happens, has happened to more than one person, but he was a child in India and he was out doing something with his brother, like they were doing day labor work or something like that. And he essentially gets kidnapped and put into an orphanage. So it's human trafficking, basically. He gets oh my goodness! Put into an orphanage, sold, sold to someone who then bring you know brings him into the orphanage. And and he's like, I'm not an orphan. I have a family, but like nobody makes the connection. And he ends up getting adopted by a family in Utah, and. Somehow, in the course of events with that family, he like rediscovers all these memories that are kind of hidden, and they begin to be like, "Oh my oh gosh, my I think this child we've adopted has a family." I can't imagine how they would feel. And so they they searched it out. They they really. So I won't tell you how it ends, but it is awesome. it is an amazing story of just almost unbelievable events, chain of events. Um, that this poor kid endured as I, I can't believe he was much more than eight or nine by the time he made it to the United States. Um, but as has become a very successful of all things, import export person, he brings, he brings in artifacts and, and, you know, rugs and what a great story. furniture and stuff from, uh, from India and from, from India. Yeah. So uh, he, he's, he's, he's wow. embraced his culture, his history and no kidding. And he's learned to make uh, a good make living a off living of it. Off but of this that. book is, I'm sure this book made him a mint more than he could ever make. I it hope is. so. <laughs> I hope so. It sounds like a great it's book. It's an incredible book. And, and there, like I say, I think there's been a couple of either adaptations or apparently this thing happens, but there's some movies out there. I think one's called lion or something like that, but. Oh, okay. That sounds familiar. All right, so here's a here's a completely different type of story, and uh, this is a great one. Um, so the book is called Deep Survival by Lawrence Gonzalez, and I got this from my hiking buddy, Skip. So hey, Skip, <laughs> if you're listening. But this is an awesome book. And this is a – so Lawrence Gonzalez is a um, – uh, I don't know. He lives in New Mexico. He's still alive. But his father was a World War II pilot. And his father gets shot down five miles up in the air, no parachute, and lived. And so his kid, and then the, and then the story just like goes on because then when he lands, the the German farmer who is, happens to be there pulls out a gun, holds it to his head, and pulls the trigger, and his Click. dad still lives. 
So did he get shot the, or it just went click? Well, I'm not going to show you the oh, end of the book, right? Okay. That's the cliffhanger that begins okay. deep survival. <laughs> okay. And, and Lawrence Gonzalez spends his life trying to figure out how in the world people survive. Why do some people survive and some don't? So it's, oh, interesting. And he comes up with 12 practical rules that surviving people can, can live by. And, and so it fits hand in glove with Viktor Frankl, much lighter, right? Great, great drama survivor stories. And one of the survivor stories he tells is one of my friends, a guy named Nate Dick, who survived uh, falling down Long's Peak and got an ice axe stabbed into his aorta, and he lived to tell the story. So there's some great drama in here. There's 12 practical pieces of advice. It's a wonderful read. It's an audible book read by a, I haven't read the audible. I actually read the paper. But um, my buddy did the audible, and he said the, the narrator is very good. So Deep Survival by Lawrence Gonzalez. It's a good read. Yeah, and just a, a final plug, again, for our founding father, George Washington. You could write a whole book on the amazing circumstances that he survived. But just oh along those goodness. same lines, is like he, he came out of some battles where he had musket ball holes through his little hat, you know, the little <laughs> triangle hat. Right. And, and he, he didn't get hit. No. <laughs> or jacket that you know he had holes in his jacket and everyone's like, um, the the <laughs> Indians close. the Indians actually he was he was well known among the Indian ranks as just the the white they call him a ghost or the silver ghost or something oh that's right I remember that yeah they they yeah, couldn't kill him they couldn't kill him amazing so yeah uh, there's something to that 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 yeah you know there's like I say I call it providence that there's some greater purpose and ties into man's search for meaning that that. Um, it does. It does. You know, one finding of the, your reason why. And this you're is here. this is a Viktor Frankl, and and this is a, a, a Lawrence Gonzalez truism. It's um, people who who love others, who have a reason to live beyond themselves, who can see that and feel that, are the survivors. Yep. Whoa, man. On that note, um, that's hopefully given some of you something to think about as well as uh, add to your reading list. I'm sure we'll come back to this again because I've got like 20 more books. Some of them are, <laughs> I'm just getting started. are sequence books, but uh, um, yeah, I could, we could go I give, I give book recommendations away like uh, free advice. It's probably what it's worth. I love free, it. Free, but they're, um, they're awesome. All this was a lot of fun. It's always great to pick your brain, Nate. Absolutely. It's always fun to, to chat about these sorts of things and, and kind of, like you say, get to know each other a little better. Yeah. Thank you, Nate. Fun times. Have a beautiful day. Thank you for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed the information we shared. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to share it with someone else and join us next time. If you want to meet with a member of the team, please contact us at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's info at expertnetworkteam.com. If you have special topics you'd like to hear about, please reach out to us and let us know at the same email address. Again, that's info at expertnetworkteam.com. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you for listening to this podcast. We want to remind you that listening to this podcast does not establish a client professional relationship with any of the firms represented nor does it constitute legal, investment, or accounting advice, and the views are those of the professionals only. Investment advisory services may be provided through a and Financial Services, and securities may be provided through Genios Wealth Management. 